past performance of companies. It is important to be able to predict their future performance and we'll want to know their future performance because we'll want to know if we should buy their stock, should we buy their bonds, uh, should we go work for them, uh, are we going to be able to compete with them in the future. And there's three different kinds of analysis that our book talks about horizontal, vertical, and ratio analysis. So the first thing we learn about is horizontal analysis. Put uh, two comparative income statements or two comparative balance sheets next to each other and look at the change from year to year. That's why it's called horizontal. So you take the new net sales minus the old net sales divided by the old net sales and you find out that they had a 14.2% increase and net income was up by 26.5. So that's pretty darn good, but we really don't have enough information. We need to know what the rest of the industry was doing and what this company was doing the years before that. So one number all by itself really doesn't give us enough information. We need context. We need to know what the industry is doing and what the company has been doing. Another technique is called vertical analysis. <clears throat> Create common sized financial statements. So for the income statement, take everything and express it as a percent of that year's sales then look across and do a horizontal analysis. So this company uh, last year had net income of 11.4% of sales and now it's up to 12.6% of sales. Looks like a good improvement, but once again, we need more context. What's happening to the rest of the industry and what's been happening to this company previously? And speaking of the industry, how do we compare two companies of different sizes. How do we compare a billion dollar company to a million dollar company? Well, we use ratios. Let's start with some liquidity ratios. We'll look at working capital. Sometimes some textbooks will call this net working capital. We'll take current assets minus current liabilities. So for this company in year four, the current assets are 168,000 minus current liabilities of 46,000 gives them working capital of 122,000. In year three, it's 145,000 minus 43,000 or 102,000. So working capital has increased from year three to year four. We also might look at the current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. For this company in year four, it would be 168,000 of current assets divided by current liabilities of 46,000, which would give them a current ratio of 3.65 to one. And this would allow us to compare them to companies that are much larger and much smaller because now it's in the form of a ratio. One of the shortcomings of the current ratio is included in the assets are current assets like inventory and like prepaid expenses. They can't turn those into cash very quickly. So instead we might use the quick ratio. We'll take the current assets minus the inventory minus the prepaid expenses. And for year four, that'll give us a quick ratio of 2.04 to one. For year three, that'll give us a quick ratio of 2.28 to one. And if we're not in the cash business, if we're not in the restaurant business, if we're not in the grocery business, but we're a dentist or a doctor and we send out invoices, we're gonna have accounts receivable. And one of the things we might measure is our accounts receivable turnover. Take our net credit sales divided by average accounts receivable. And this would be a good time to tell you that every textbook is gonna have slightly different formulas. Some textbooks might not use average accounts receivable in the denominator. They might use end of the year or beginning of the year receivables. But let's take our net credit sales and gosh, where we're gonna find net credit sales, we can't. We're gonna just assume that all the sales were made on credit and we're gonna divide them by average accounts receivable. So for year four, that would mean accounts receivable turnover of 16.98. For year three, it's 14.41. So the way I think about this account receivable turnover is how many times do we fill up our drawer with bills to go out and then empty it out as people paid us. An accounts receivable turnover uh, number may not make much sense, but let's put 365 in the numerator and that accounts receivable in the denominator and that'll tell us our average days to collect receivables. For this company, for, two th for year four, that ratio would be 21 days, and in year three, it would be 25 days. So we're collecting faster from our customers. 
We might do a similar thing with our inventory. How quickly are we filling up our warehouses and emptying them out? So we'll take our cost of goods sold over average inventory. Again, other textbooks might take end of the year inventory or beginning of the year inventory, but we're gonna take cost of goods sold over average inventory. So for year four, that's gonna be 10.8. For year three, that's gonna be 11.57. And we wanna turn that inventory as quickly as possible. And a way to see if we're doing that as quickly as possible is to take 365 in the numerator and put that inventory turnover in the denominator. That'll tell us on average how many days it takes us to sell our inventory. For this company, for year four, that would be 34 days. And for year three, it would be 32 days. All right, let's look at some solvency ratios, trying to figure out a company's long-term debt paying ability. Let's look at the debt to assets ratio, total liabilities over total assets. For this company, for year four, that would be 29%. For year three, it would be 31%. Or another way to come at the same notion would be debt to equity ratio, total liabilities over total stockholders equity. For this company for year four, that would be 0.4 to one. And for year three, that would be 0.46 to one. We might wanna also measure if they can afford the debt they have by looking at the number of times interest is earned. We'll take EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, and put that over interest expense. For this company, uh, for year four, that would be 6.25 times. For year three, that would be six times. And just like you might pledge your home as security for your home mortgage, companies often pledge long-term assets as security for debt. So we might look at the ratio plant assets to long-term liabilities. In other words, net plant assets over long-term liabilities. Uh, for this company in year four, that would be a ratio of 3.4 to one. And for year three, it would be 3.1 to one. Okay, we looked at uh, ratios for liquidity. We looked at ratios for solvency. Let's look at the measures of profitability. Let's look at uh, net margin. So what we'll do is we'll take the net income over net sales. For year four, this company, that would be 2.78%. For year three, it was 2.75%. Next, we might look at what's called asset turnover ratio, sales over average total assets. How are we using our assets to generate sales? It's great that we got sales, but if our competitors are generating the same sales with a lot less assets, they're doing a better job than we are. So net sales over average total assets. For this company, for year four, it's 1.87. For year three, it's 1.83. Two last profitability ratios. Return on investment, abbreviated ROI, net income over average total assets. For year four, that would be 5.19%. For year three, that would be 5.03. And a very similar ratio is return on equity. We'll take the net income over the average total stockholders equity. So for year four, this would be 7.4%. Year three, that would be 7.6%. All right, let's look at a few stock market ratios. First, an important one, earnings per share. How much earning power do you buy when you buy a share of company stock? We'll take the net earnings available for the common stock over the average number of outstanding common shares. Let's assume at the end of year four, this company had 15,000 shares outstanding. At the end of year three, they had 12,500 shares outstanding. And let's be sure to subtract $3,000 for the preferred dividends out of the uh, numerator because those dollars belong to the preferred stockholders. So you end up with uh, earnings per share of $1.60 for year four. Book value per share, in crude terms, if we closed up shop and we sold all our assets, we paid off all our liabilities, how much money would be left for the common stockholders? We'll take the stockholders equity minus the preferred stock, because those dollars belong to the preferred stockholders, over the outstanding common shares. So in this case, that would be 362,000 minus 50,000, all over the year end amount of 15,000 shares outstanding. So you end up with $20.80 per share of book value. Two other things we might look at is the price earnings ratio, the market price per share over the earnings per share, and the dividend yield. 
if we buy a share of stock and we collect the dividends, that's extra cash a company has to, to pay out to its shareholders. We'll put that dividend number per year over the market price of the share to figure out what our yield is when we invest in that stock, looking exclusively at dividends.